everybody. Welcome. It's Weird Mythic Podcast with me, Naomi, and I'm always joined with the lovely Serena. Hello, Serena. Hello, Naomi. Hello, hello. Oh, man. So, how was your day today? Oh, gosh. Okay, look. (laughs) So, (laughs) yes. I'm going to fill you in on what happened today at work. So, Mm -hmm. my manager, he got a new job, like a new position with the company. So I'm fully, like, 100% by myself in the office now. Mm -hmm. Well, today I walked out into the warehouse and the door locked behind me. (laughs) So I got locked out of my office and I'm by myself. So obviously, like, there's nobody there that can let me in. I don't have a key to that door. (laughs) So... Mind you, it was like 103 degrees today in a hot warehouse that has no air conditioning. The bay doors were not open because I'm there by myself, right? Why would they be? Oh, my gosh. So, so I, you were legit locked inside the warehouse. Yeah. So there's an out. There's a door to go out, right? So to the outside. So I go out the door, but I'm behind the gate. And it's like an automated gate. And I can't open it from behind the gate like you have to be in a car to activate or you have to have the clicker and I didn't have the clicker and obviously I don't have a car like (laughs) I'm locked you know behind the gate Mm -hmm. so we have like neighbors that share that back part with us and we're in like a very small like warehouse area like there's not a lot going on around us well the neighbors like their bay doors were shut I couldn't get a hold of anybody Luckily, I did have my phone, so I called my technicians, and I'm like, hey, who's close, right? The closest technician was 40 minutes away. Oh, geez. So, for 40 minutes, I was outside, just standing there. And then there were there were two guys, like, doing construction across the street. And so, I was, like, yelling for them, like, help me, right? <laughs> and I don't know if they thought I was, like, hitting on them or, like, checking them out oh, or no. something, but they wouldn't come over. And I'm like, this fucking sucks. So, yeah, I was out there for, like, almost an hour until... And the thing is, this all happened at, like, 3.05. I was going to leave at 3 o'clock. So, (laughs) I'm like, this sucks really bad. So, eventually, I I did get there. I tried to climb the gate, too. And it's, like, one of those iron pokey ones. So, that (laughs) didn't turn out too well. (laughs) But, yeah, it, it was an adventure, for sure. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you're okay. That really <laughs> sucks that you were locked inside a freaking warehouse when it's way too hot for yeah. any of that shit. It was like, so hot. Damn. So once I finally got outside, I like tried to turn we have a um like a water spigot out there. And so I tried to turn the water on. I'm like, I'm gonna at least, you know, cool off or something in the water, like put my feet in or yeah. whatever. It's Texas, so the water came out really hot. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just shut off so i don't know oh no <laughs> yeah i don't know it was definitely an adventure 10 out of 10 do not recommend um no, so not at all safe to say i'm asking yeah. for keys tomorrow <laughs> oh yes yes you definitely need yeah. those <laughs> oh man well jesus that's one hell of a story yeah my day was not as um uh, you know eventful didn't have that much going <laughs> on at all no it was just Looking at a computer all day, so I'm happy to be home and talking to you. Yay! <laughs> I'm excited for today's episode. I feel like we haven't done a cryptids episode in a while, right? I feel the same way. It's very strange. I mean, like, we, we talked a little bit about the Little Mermaid, but that wasn't really a cryptid. We were talking about the, the you know, story from Hans Christian Andersen. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so this will be fun. Um, but first, we got to say, you know, we're going to be at the True Crime Podcast Festival in Dallas at the end of August. So I hope you got your tickets because I believe they are sold out now, are yeah, they? Yeah, you can't get tickets anywhere, but they did make a post about out next year so it's gonna be august i think 4th through the 7th next year so keep an eye out it's gonna be in a different city though so we're gonna have to find out where it is and then we're gonna have to go to that one too i'm hoping it's in california so then i can fly out to you (laughs) this time (laughs) 
Hell yeah. Or somewhere just like that has like kind of spookiness to it. Yeah. I really want to go up to like Washington and Mm -hmm. like do some of their spooky ghost tours and stuff. So if there's another reason to go up there, if they happen to be in that type of city, dude. Yeah, then we can go go visit my brother. State. Yeah, dude. Hell yes. Yes. (laughs) So yeah, but you guys, we also would like to hear any cryptid or creepy stories. Send us some info at weirdmythicpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on all of our social media for Weird Mythic Podcast on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all that good stuff. Yes. So yeah. All right. right, So Serena, I sent you a picture today. It was so creepy. (laughs) It looked like, I don't even know, like a like a hyena with like it had like human eyes though <laughs> I don't yeah know okay, how to so describe like, what sent, that thing was <laughs> so i sent a picture to serena a couple hours ago to let her know like hey this is the cryptid i'll be covering today and all she said was ew gross that was it that was the only thing i got from her that's so. the only emotion i had like i don't know how else to <laughs> portray that besides ew it was gross Yes, so I I will say that that was an older taxidermy from, like, the late 1800s, so I'm just saying, like, since it's so old, it's actually still in really good shape. The eyes, though, you're right, it's supposed to be possible type of canine, and I don't know if that's how eyes look when they're canines. It it looked like it had human eyes, like, it was, like, I don't know, looking at me with its knowledge. Oh, I... (laughs) With its knowledge. I don't know what that knowledge would be, but... Human things. Human things. All right, so I am going to be talking about the the Shunka Warakin. And it is uh, mostly seen in Montana, but it has also been been seen in Illinois, Nebraska, and Iowa. Um, The word or name Shunka Warakin... It does translate to carries off dogs in Iowa and other Native American languages and tribes have also said like, yep, this just means carries off dog, which is kind of creepy considering it's also a dog type. So the Shunka Warrican, it does resemble a wolf or a hyena. It does have characteristics of both. It has also been said to have the head of a boar, though. In a lot of Native American folklore, they will talk about something similar that kind of looks like a wolf, but also looks like um, a wild boar. So let's get into the story here. So we're going to talk about a story back in 1886 when a man named Israel Ammon Hutchins, I'm just going to call him Hutchins, he shot an animal at the Sun Ranch in Montana, and he eventually gave it to this man named Joseph Sherwood, this thing, animal that he shot on his farm. Joseph Sherwood uh, is a taxidermist or was a taxidermist and ended up mounting the animal and putting it on display in his general store. And the store is in Henry's Lake, Idaho. Um, and it is no longer there at that store, but it was there for a very, very long time. And it was actually lost and then found again in 2007. So sometime between 1886 and 2007, it disappeared and then came back. Joseph Sherwood did name this taxidermied animal that he did called the Ring Dacus. But Native Americans and locals in the 1800s did say this was definitely the Shunka Warakim who Hutchins shot and then gave to Sherwood. So in a book, called Trails to Nature's Mystery, The Life of a Working Naturalist. Ross Hutchins, which is um, Israel Hutchins' son or grandson, I don't have it written down, but Ross Hutchins in 1997 wrote that book. Oh, it was about his grandpa. So yeah, it was his grandpa who shot the the Shunka Warrican, and he wrote a book about it. So in his book, he does describe what it looks like, which is a wolf-like beast with dark colored hair. It is seen about 15 miles around from where his grandpa lived, but it was also seen by other ranchers at that time. This creature had very high shoulders and then a sloped back like a hyena. His grandpa, Israel, uh, was one of was the guy who shot it, of course, and um, gave it to Joseph Sherwood in 1886. But there was also claims that this thing, this hyena hybrid, the Shunku Warakin, 
cried like a human when it was injured. Ew. So that was probably the most creepy thing that I found of like, there's always some sort of weird thing that the creature does or some noise that it makes, but it cries like a human really creeped me out. <laughs> yeah, I hate that. Yes. So that is the picture I sent to Serena was of this taxidermied wolf hyena hybrid thing. Um, but in December of 2005, all the way up to November in 2006, in Macon, Montana, there was a wolf, and I'm going to put wolf in quotes because it never directly said wolf. It said wolf dog creature in a lot of, like, the articles I was reading. And in Montana, Macon in 2006, or Montana, Macon, Macon, Montana, sorry, <laughs> there was this creature, and it was killing livestock, and it actually killed 36 sheep within that year and ended up killing more. I think it came out to like 120 sheep total. And that was official that some creature killed 120 sheep in Montana. The, the fish and wildlife officials actually said like, yeah, there is something out there killing livestock. Oh, that's so scary. And they were unable to ident identify this creature for a while, but it was shot. Somebody was able to shoot it. Do I have a date of when it was shot? I do not, unfortunately. But this creature was shot. So Montana wildlife officials go out to collect this random animal that's been killing livestock. And according to them, it was 106 pounds. It had reddish yellow fur. And they believe that it could have been a four-year-old male wolf with just red hair. However, mm -hmm. the back was still sloped, and from reports of the person who shot it, it was, like, very much red and yellow. It wasn't just a reddish tint to this fur. It was definitely a red and yellow fur on this dog-like creature. Okay. So, Montana Fish and Wildlife believed that it was a wolf, and that is the report that they put out. Um, but, I mean, there's, there's wolves in Montana, but there's only 90 gray wolves that have been reported and are registered in Montana. And I don't have a date from when they did um, that collection of data, but I do believe it was after 2007 when they did that type of um, data work to see how many gray wolves were still in Montana. So there hasn't been any recent sightings since 2005 of any sort of hyena, dog, wolf-like creature out there in Montana. But the one that was shot, uh, that fish, that uh, Montana Fish and Wildlife said was a four-year-old male wolf, they did take some of the muscle tissue from that wolf and sent it over to the University of L.A., but I couldn't find any records of what the University of L.A. thought it was. So I thought that was just interesting to throw out there. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find out what they thought of the muscle tissue. I think it's great that the Montana Fish and Wildlife sent off tissue to another location to have it tested. But I couldn't find what those results were from those tests. So was it an actual wolf? We actually have no idea. So it's very odd. though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the picture that I sent to Serena, again, um, was back from 1886, and it was named a redonkis from the person who actually, like, did the taxidermy and whatnot. A lot of people are actually thinking this is something related to the Ozark Howler, which we talked about. And if you remember from that episode, the picture that I posted on our Instagram of that little dog creature with the horns it also had a sloped hind quarters i mean i think it's very interesting that people were making that connection which i think is really cool considering we we have covered that yeah and i believe the ozark howler has a very odd scream when it is being attacked yeah, or I being think that injured, was why it was so. called that exactly so i did a little bit more research on what this creature could be considering it doesn't seem like there's a pack of them but there are sightings around so in north america about one to three million years ago there was a north american hyena i had no idea yeah. that there were hyenas in north america i didn't either so that was pretty cool to find out they have been very much extinct but 
who's to say that there isn't something out there that still has like that recessive gene to having that North American hyena on any of the wolves that are currently in Montana. Um, there was also a bear dog <laughs> Um, and it looked more like a dog than a bear to me on the pictures I was seeing, like, you know, rent, like, you know, um, when scientists are like, this is what a dinosaur could look like. And they have this picture of it, but we obviously have no idea what they look mm -hmm. like. Um, but yeah, there was also a bear dog in North um, America, mainly in the California region. And it was here about 8 million years ago. So, I mean, who's to say there isn't some sort of creature recessive gene maybe it's coming back out who knows i just thought it was really interesting that something was shot in 2005 2006 that they say was a wolf but then they sent off tissue to have it tested and the fact that even in the 18 late 1800s that there was this thing that they also shot and had taxidermied and it does not look like a wolf at all so that is they, this, that is the Shunko Warrikin in Montana. So, yeah. That's creepy. <laughs> Very creepy. I just, thought, I just thought it was way interesting. And there's not too many cryptids that we come across that we have an actual taxidermied something that is legit. This is legit. Yeah. Like, they, it is real. So, I just thought that was really cool. I had to mention it. So, yeah. That Disgusting. Was the <laughs> I just think it's great that it's still around. Like um, the the guy who had it uh, taxidermied, the the guy who had it shot, Hutchins. His family still has it, oh, so nice. I think it's great that it just stays in the family. And they have this weird taxidermied cryptid in their house that they'll just pass along, pass down to, to generations. <laughs> yeah, I think it's great. So yeah, That's funny. yeah. So. All right. Well, I do have another story because that was kind of quick. So if you want to get into another interesting story, we got do some it. time. What do you think? Yeah. All right. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So this is a little different. It is, I don't, I don't know if it's considered exactly a cryptid or just something creepy. Um, whenever you look up like cryptids in California, you might come across something called the Dark Watchers. It's not a creature like the Shunka Warrikin or like the Ozark Howler or Shapeshifters or anything like that. Um, but it is something that has been seen since the 17, actually, no, even since the 1500s. Now I'm looking at my notes again. So let me just set the scene for you. So California, the sun is setting and you're walking along the Santa Lucia Mountains, which is kind of in, like, the Carmel area down to San Luis Obispo. Okay. So you're out there walking along the mountains. You can see the ocean because it's just mountains, cliff, ocean. It's very pretty. And as you're walking along, you start to see these very, very tall figures come out of the trees on the St. Lucia Mountains. And they're just walking over to the edge of the cliff. And then they stop. And they're just looking out the looking out over the coastline of California. They are about ten feet tall, no distinctive features, and a lot of the sightings, they have this large brimmed hat and long black cloak. They are bipedal and they seem to be in a human like form. So you can kind of see like the large hat, the shoulders, and then the cloak down to their feet. I hate that. And some of them are even carrying some sort of staff or cane. That is the Dark Watchers of California. The Spanish settlers started coming to this part of California in 1542, and that is pretty much along Highway 1 and 101. So that's what goes across these mountains. So it's really this great mountain, awesome hiking, a ledge, a little bit of the highway sometimes, and then ocean, or just the mountains and directly to the ocean. Yeah. Um, so it's steep cliffs right there. And that is when the Spanish settlers started reporting that they started seeing these tall figures just looking out over the ocean. And it usually was around when the sun was coming up or when the sun was setting. So I'm going to talk about somebody who we should all at least know his name. You know who John Steinbeck is, right, Serena? No. 
Uh, yes, you do. Who He's the one who wrote up Mice of Men. Mice <laughs> of Men. Grapes of Wrath. East of Eden. Come on. Yeah. Nope. My brother this would be so re- disappointed uh, in me. This is required reading. You've never read of Mice and Men? Um, is that the one where... No, I don't think so. <laughs> Well, there's also a movie about it with Gary Sinise. Is that the one where the, the guy, like, pets the animals too hard and they die? Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, yes. I never read that. <laughs> to put it simply, yes. I never read that one. I don't think oh. that was required of me. Oh, man. Well, I, I took anyway. I took AP composition and AP literature, and I never read that. I was reading, like, the Bible and stuff. <laughs> oh, Huh. My AP classes and UP classes were much different. <laughs> yeah, we, we were doing, like, we did, like, the Bible. We read um, Heart of Darkness. Like, there was a lot of good books okay. that we did read, but that was not one of them. <laughs> All right. Well, I thought it was required, but I am wrong. <laughs> I mean, we had a very different uh, school yeah, system different in Hawaii, yeah. so. I'm sure. Yeah, true, true. Okay, so John Steinbeck. He grew up in Salinas, California. He was born in 1902. He did sadly pass away in 1968. Um, I do have a note here. He was a lifelong smoker, guys, so keep that in mind. Don't smoke so much. (laughs) At all. Anyways. So, in one of his short stories called Flight, which was published in 1938, Steinbeck actually mentions the Dark Watchers directly. So in this story, Flight, it is based in Monterey and around a family, the Torres family. And something about the Torres family, there's lots of kids, but one of the sons actually ends up murdering someone. So the mom of that son tells him to run off, go go into the mountains and try to hide from the law. So they're trying to protect him. I don't remember why he killed somebody. I didn't, I don't, I don't remember why, but he killed someone. They told him to take off. The mom tells him as he's running away, quote, when you come to the high mountains, if you see any dark watching men, do not go near them. Do not speak to them. Unquote. Say less. Like, Say less. <laughs> all you need to know, don't talk to Fucking them. noted. I will avoid <laughs> men at all costs. Trust me. <laughs> any dark watching men, we will avoid. Just men, but Yeah. <laughs> So later on in the story, the son does say again that he saw a black figure for a moment. And then he quickly looked at it where he saw the figure, and it was one of the Dark Watchers. (laughs) So that is a direct, you know, mention of the Dark Watchers and, you know, Steinbeck's short story. And one of the reasons he does mention the Dark Watchers turns out... That his mother, that grew up in the Monterey area, told him about the Dark Watchers. And according to her, when she was a girl and she was walking to school, she would actually bring food to one of the, you know, areas that she was walking by on her way. And she left it there as an offering to the Dark Watchers. And every time she would come back on her way back from school, there would be a flower in place of where the food was. I just think that's so cool. Okay. I love it. I love it. So another story and another um, mention of the Steinbach. So uh, John's son, Thomas Steinbach, who was also a writer, he also wrote about the Dark Watchers in some of his short stories. So I just think that's great that the Steinbachs have this thing with the Dark Watchers, and I just think that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. So there's also mention of the Dark Watchers in some poems. So there's this other poet. His name is Robinson Jeffers. And he does mention the the Dark Watchers in some of his poems. But I found another poem. And it is called Such Counsels You Gave to Me. And in this poem, it is about a man who is going through the mountains. And quote, he thought it might be one of the Watchers who are often seen in this length of coastal range, forms that look human to human eyes, but certainly are not human. They come from behind the ridges to watch. He was not surprised when the figures turned towards him in, a, in the quiet twilight showed on his face. Then it melted and merged into shadows beyond it. 
<laughs> more <Yeah>. stuff <laughs> on poems in California and the Dark Watchers. And I believe that poem was actually written in the 30s. Wow. Wow. So, if you look up California Dark Watchers, you're going to have a whole bunch of stuff come up of regular, everyday people saying, yes, I saw them. Yeah, I was hiking that mountain range and I saw them. I saw them when I was walking. I saw them when I was driving. The sun was setting and I saw these big figures on the side of the mountain. What are they doing? So you're going to find a lot of that. So... I decided to do a little bit of research to see if there was anything I could find on Native American lore in that area. I found very, very little next to nothing of American folk, of Native American folklore. We all know Native Americans have all kinds of different supernatural beings that are very much alive in their culture and they see them and they're there. But I couldn't find anything directly related to the dark watchers that the Spanish settlers were talking about or even that the Steinbecks were talking about. But what I did find was in the uh, Chumash tribe, they have some cave paintings in um, that area of California. I really wish I had, oh, here it is. In the Borough Flats in Southern California, there's some uh, paintings, cave paintings from the Chumash tribe. And when I was looking at them, of course, there's obviously stars. I could see that these were suns. I saw that there were some crosses, maybe some things that looked like canoes to me. I also saw what could be like some sort of grain or agriculture that was painted on there. But there's these two black and white striped figures that are also painted on these caves. And there was a game that the Chumash people played all the time. They were very athletic and had lots of different games where they had these black and white sticks. But these sticks didn't have a head on them. And in these paintings, that's a head and shoulders, but then they're in black and white. So that was really the only thing I could find if that is related to the Dark Watchers that we're talking about. Yeah. But I couldn't find anything specific in their culture in those paintings. But it did just look a little odd when I was looking at them that these sticks had heads on them. And they were very, like, tall compared to everything else that was painted on those caves. So if anyone knows anything about the Chumash tribe, maybe I missed something, but go ahead and enlighten me. Let me know what those could be at weirdmythicpodcast at gmail.com. Please let me know. Um, I just did like Google searches and looked at them myself. I could definitely be misinterpreting these though. Interesting. Something else that came up in the research was something called the Bracken Specter. Have you heard of that? Nope. Okay, so (laughs) the Bracken Specter. A lot of this has uh, been seen in, like, Germany and in, uh, like, the Swiss Alps in those mountains is what they call the Bracken Spectre. Now, here's an explanation of what it is. It is an optical illusion. When the light projects a shadow through mist, it can make a triangle shape. Shadows that make this shape seem a lot bigger in the center of the triangle. So it's really just a, a, a optical illusion. Um, the only thing is, is when you look up Brock Inspector, it definitely looks like somebody is like has their hands like up above their above their uh, of their arms above their heads, and they're like there's light shining behind them, like like an angel almost. How you see those okay. in like paintings of like the bright light behind them and their arms in the air, definitely looks like a person. I don't see the Dark Watchers having that same effect of having the light behind them and then it's they're all dark. Because the Brock Inspectors, it definitely looks like a shadow, but you can also kind of see through the Brock Inspector. So hmm. it's a little bit of what the explanation could be of the Dark Watchers. Yeah, I don't like that one. <laughs> and, and it's just like one of those things where it, it does have a logical explanation on, on lights and playing tricks on on your eyes. And we all know that if, if a person sees something that they don't technically recognize, your brain is going to make a connection to something and you're going to be like, oh, it's a 10 foot tall man, not 
lights playing tricks on me, you know? So I don't know if that's where I would go first. <laughs> but <laughs> I guess. It's just other trains of thought yeah. and people trying to find a logical explanation for people seeing these giant figures on mountain ranges. So there was one explanation. However, I think <laughs> when I was... Oh, because I'm not going to think like that. I'm like, no, it's not just lights playing tricks on us. I started looking into the hat man, which we have kind of talked about a little bit on the show, but haven't really like dived into. If you know anything about the hat man, he is a shadow person and he does want to make contact with you. But usually the hat man appears in your bedroom and not outside. But when you look at sightings of the Hat Man, it definitely feels like the the Dark Watchers of California. Tall, dark figures in a cloak and a hat. And it's always a wide-brimmed hat. I think it's an interesting connection. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know, man. That is the Dark Watchers of California. I also found, like, some other stuff about that area that... Of course, there's been Bigfoot sightings in those areas. Do you know how many Bigfoot things I came across doing research? Like, everything everything was Bigfoot. Like, today especially, I was trying to do some research on my downtime, what little Mm -hmm. downtime I did have, and everything was like, this is Bigfoot, this is Bigfoot. I'm like, we can't do that. Like, we can't do that yet. (laughs) Not yet, not yet. Um, But there has also been nuclear testing back in, like, the 20s and 30s in that area. So people talk about maybe there's some nuclear people over there. Who knows? (laughs) Nuclear people. (laughs) Yeah. So um, it's just, like, random things you come across when you do research on random things like the Dark Watchers of California, people started talking about how Aleister Crowley had something to do with it, that L. Ron Hubbard had something to do with it also. And I'm like, what are you talking about? (laughs) But I mean, like, they went into, like, details of Bohemian Grove and how Death Valley and that the Devil's Punch Bowl is nearby and all kinds of other conspiracy theories about what the Dark Watchers could actually be. So I would very much like somebody's opinion, especially somebody who has seen these or has done more research than I have, because there was just so much coming at me after doing that research on them. So those are the Dark Watchers of California. I would really like to see them at some point, considering I've been through that area more than once. Haven't seen shit. I want to see that. (laughs) I think I'm good. No, I want to see it. Because they don't seem like... So the hat man, he comes into your room and he usually deals with people who very much experience sleep paralysis. And he seems a little mean. Like he'll shake your bed and wake you up and shit. The Dark Watchers (laughs) don't have that maliciousness to them, I feel like. They really are just watching over the California coastline. So I want to see how close I could get to them. Yeah, I don't know. I'm good. <laughs> You're good? You go ahead. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll go figure it out. <laughs> but yeah, again, guys, let me know what you think about the Dark Watchers of California. If you're in Montana, let me know about the uh, Shunka Warrican at weirdmythicpodcast at gmail.com. Yeah, also, we hope to see you guys at the True Crime Podcast Festival in Dallas. Yeah. If you didn't get your tickets, it's okay. We are going to be doing a Spotify Live episode, so you can be sure to catch that. We're going to be, it's August 27th at... Ooh, what time are we? 10.30, I think. I think think we are at 10.30. We have it on all of our social media, so I think it's at 10.30 in the morning. So hopefully you guys wake up to catch that whatever time zone you're in. Yeah. Um... Follow us on Twitter at Weird Mythic. Hit us up on Facebook at Weird Mythic Podcast, as well as Instagram at Weird Mythic Podcast. And please, please, please send us any recommendations or sightings or anything you guys want to hear us talk about at Weird Mythic Podcast at gmail.com. Yes, yes. And again, thanks for tuning in, and we'll have another episode coming out soon, guys. Yay. Bye.